technospheric understanding requires us to extend our sensory capabilities to reconsider modes of attunement, representation, and habits of perception by investigating the soundscape. As a mode of sensory training, I'd like to invite all of you to join me in a deep listening exercise. Please take a moment to get yourself comfortable and then close your eyes. Think about the difference between hearing and listening. Attune yourselves to all the sounds you hear since listening requires attunement. Start by listening to the local sounds, those that seem immediately around you. Listen to the breathing of others. the noises of stomachs, to the lights, to the seats. What sounds are unknown to you? How many? Listen to the building itself. Listen to the sounds beyond this building. Using your hearing to attune your listening, try to extend beyond your normal patterns of listening. Listen to the edge of the noticeable, volume, frequency, texture. I would like us all to now sit in silence for the next four minutes to listen deeply as a sensory training exercise. Please remain silent with your eyes closed until you are instructed to do otherwise. You can open your eyes. For the past 90 seconds of the exercise, you were listening to ultrasonic frequencies, frequencies that exist in a range outside of human hearing capabilities that were recorded as you were entering the auditorium tonight, but then pitch shifted down to become audible to human hearing. Using technology, we've been able to make the inaudible soundscape accessible. As technology historian Emily Thompson writes, like a landscape, a soundscape is simultaneously a physical environment and a way of perceiving that environment. It is both a world and a culture constructed to make sense of that world. Perhaps seeking, Perhaps seeking sound at the boundary of my senses, and especially ultrasound, is a way to physically pause it what Thomas Nagel philosophically posits in his famous essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Which is to also ask, what are the limits of embodied inquiry? How is technological objectivity a prosthetic for my own subjectivity? It would seem to be a way of accessing a small sliver of other experiential worlds, the ultrasonic umwelt of a bat or of any other alien point of view. To be physical is to be discerning. The esthete, she who is committed to aesthetics, is like the athlete who is committed to athletics. Both train at the limits of their embodied capacities, 
at high altitudes and in the thin air of possible self-knowledge. But what about the objective point of view? Objective knowledge about our vast phenomenal universe, that is, making sense of what otherwise cannot be sensed, reveals hidden unities and complexities that elude our habitual awareness. At least, this, is, this was the quasi-sublime insight that the Charles and Ray Eames film, Powers of Ten, seemed to offer me when I was a young biochemist. It begins on a fair autumn day in my home city of Chicago. The couple picnicking on the grass are strangers to us, nobodies, just as we, the viewers, seem to be of no particular body. Instead, we are somehow perfectly disembodied with a picture-perfect vantage from above, the view from nowhere. As we begin to float and zoom out and out, we begin to also pass through abstract windows of size and scale, the world framed as graph paper. Soon we are going faster than the speed of light to some edge of the observable universe, further still, and then to a full stop. And then we collapse back onto our planetary and urbanized frame, slowing down on our approach to the body of the man on the grass, but then simply entering him without pause through microstructures of cells, onto DNA, and then further still to the material fundaments of the cosmos on the subatomic scale. The view from nowhere is the ultimate access to everywhere, freeing us from our fickle, fleshy, subjective perspective. Without this nowhere view, we are stuck in being simply now here, feeling the weather without knowing the climate, being a part that has no sense of the whole. Theorist Peter Half claims that, as part of the technosphere, a rule of inaccessibility distorts our perception of the Anthropocene, and that the clarity and the immediacy of our experience tend to overshadow the importance of the more diffuse and hard to visualize technosphere. This can be true, but I don't believe true enough to abandon techniques of embodied imagination, the most intimate of materialisms that are latent and potent within my human frame, a body that is as speculative as it is physical. We inhabit something beyond our conceptual reckoning, and yet we live through it all the same. As parts, how can we make best use of our partial knowledge? Let's return to the scale of the corporeal and consider the picnicking couple as more than just cinematic mannequins. Surveying the food for thought spread generously across their picnic blanket here, let's engage the scene and pick one morsel from one of the dishes shown. Please follow my voice as I invite you for another exercise. Open the envelope that you were given upon entering the auditorium. Reach in and see what's inside. Take the raisin and hold it on the palm of your hand. Notice its size, notice its color, and the different shadows upon its surface. Pick it up out of the palm with two fingers and gently close your eyes. Roll the, finger, uh, roll the raisins between your fingertips. Take a few moments to feel its texture, its firmness, its weight. What does it feel like on your skin? Keeping your eyes closed, pay some attention to how your hand and arm move through space as you slowly bring the raisin to your nose. Breathe in. Make note of the raisin scent, its fragrance. What about its smell is familiar? Is there anything about it that is new or perhaps unexpected? Make note of the raisin's uh, scent once again, and now slowly bring the raisin to your softly closed lips and gently place the raisin against them. Breathe in again, taking in more smells. Feel the shape of the raisin skin on your skin and also make note of any sensations taking shape in your mouth or in your stomach, 
maybe even feelings of anticipation. Now open your mouth and place the raisin on your tongue, closing your mouth, but without chewing, feel the raisin on your tongue and the space that it takes up. Then begin to move the raisin around your mouth, pushing it along your gums, teeth, and inner cheek. What changes are there in your mouth, moment by moment? What textures or sensations are changing? When you are ready, prepare to chew the raisin, noticing how and where it needs to be in your mouth and on your teeth to begin chewing. Now very consciously, take one or two bites into the raisin and notice what happens. What flavors appear? How does the rest of your body feel? Are there waves, peaks, or ripples? Continue chewing with your eyes closed. Experience the sweet sensation of the fruit's sugar on your tongue. Its sweetness is molecular. The sugar, a lattice of carbon and oxygen, derived from carbon dioxide that was pulled from the air and into the grapevine's leaves. That carbon dioxide came from the exhaled breath of a bird, of a fish, of a bat, and from the mouth of a coal smokestack on another continent. Reflect on this as you continue to chew and feel your breath push softly through your nose. Puffs of carbon dioxide formed from sugar stored in your own muscles, muscles that are now pumping your heart in your chest, if you can feel your heart beating in this moment. No doubt many of you already swallowed the raisin, <laughs> perhaps without even knowing you were swallowing it. Did you detect the feeling and intention to swallow it as it rose up within you? If you haven't swallowed the raisin and you now feel ready to, watch for this impulse as well as the feeling as it moves through your throat. Imagine how the carbon dioxide in your own breath will now be taken up by a tree or 10 trees where those molecules will be biochemically fashioned into wood and maybe then into paper, into sap, and maybe then into maple syrup. What things had to happen to turn last year's California grape into this Berlin raisin now? Where are the seeds of this former grape anyway? Did you sense any trace of them in your mouth? What is a fruit without a seed? How much did that raisin cost? What was its value in calories? How much longer could you now live, minutes or hours, if this raisin was the last thing you were to ever eat? What if you ate everything this slowly, or with just half this attention? How much less money would you make? How much more sleep would you unexpectedly get? The raisin is now deep inside you and will become you in the next few hours. And then it will become something else, and then something else, and then something else. Now feel your tongue in your mouth and let it catch any last thing remaining. Take a deep breath in. Oxygen for your inner combustion. Take an atmospheric breath out. And when you are ready, please open your eyes. This raisin exercise is an expansion of a meditation devised by American medical professor John Kabat-Zinn, who had himself modified it from a Buddhist exercise, which was modified from proceeding techniques that were developed at other times and in other contexts. Reinvesting in the potential of the immediate and embodied experience is not merely sensory, it is a way to make sense of things more complexly. It is training to reduce the unforgiving abstraction of our reductionism, to seek expansive meaning without denying all the holes in our holism. A scientific understanding is meant to be impartial understanding, but as parts of an inescapable technospheric whole, it is important to consider the virtues of being partial, of what potency partial knowledge can have for parts and participants like ourselves. The raisin is itself just a small part, but perhaps with coaxing, it can also function as an access to the inaccessible, as a holographic part of a whole. 
I borrow this conception of the holographic from philosopher Thomas Kasulis and his analysis of particular ritual objects and sites in Japanese Shinto practice. Unlike the externalized relations between things, creatures, and events that dominate our conventional view of complexity, nodes connected through networks, Kasulis points towards the view in which parts within a whole are internally related to each other as forms whose identities overlap as well as differentiate and evolve over time. Holographic relations go further still, recognizing how the whole can be evident and present in every part, be it a person, a raisin, a cloud, the ocean. As Kasulis writes, the part reflects the whole, the whole is in every part. To see this form of connectedness, the vantage point is not at a distance, but through the close examination of a single piece of evidence that functions as a holographic entry point opening to the grasp of the whole. These exercises are intended to be experiments in the recognition of the potent, interpenetrating, and holographic relations among all things, as physical as much as they are metaphysical. Pushing the boundaries of both subjectivity and objectivity, of hearing and listening, of sound and the ultrasound, of texture and metatexture. Instead of falling for the overwhelming character of the technosphere and its view from nowhere, perhaps we can take advantage of the partial view of the now here to make sense and sensation of this emerging everything. Thank you. <laughs>